going to invite Bruce Bloomer up. Um, he is going to uh, read scripture uh, today um, from Mark chapter 11. So if we'd welcome Bruce, that would be amazing. Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, tell them, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Awesome. Thank you, Bruce. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank you today for the opportunity that we have to gather together and God, as we remember the, the week of your coming, the week of your suffering, we ask God that uh, you would help us to focus, uh, that you would help us to fix our eyes upon the God who is our hope, upon the God who is our grace, upon the God who is our life, and so God, for these people in this room, I thank you so much for their lives and for their presence here and for their gifts, how you are using them in the world for good. And God, we ask that in this time that you would speak words of life and blessing and hope over us. And it's in Jesus' name and it's for Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So today we need to talk about how not all weeks are created equal. Uh, not all weeks carry the same weight, the same significance. Uh, we have like the first week of school, and there's a lot happening during the first week of school. Uh, there's a lot that's being asked of you during that first week of school. Uh, you have to go and you gather all your school supplies, and some of us are really excited about that task, others of us we just leave it to Amazon to have the things come to our uh, front door. It's just filled with a lot of busyness, a lot of things that we have to attend to. The week of a wedding, there's a lot of things happening during the week of the wedding. Lots of decisions to be made, lots of conversations to be had, lots of things to attend. Like it's just busy and it's full and there's lots happening. How about like the week of a birthday party for a kid in your house? Lots going on. You don't just show up to a birthday party of a child, right? Like there's stuff that goes along with it. Uh, you know, we live in a time where we, we pick a, t a theme for a child who's turning two. How amazing is that, right? And a cake that they're never going to eat, they will just smash their hands in it. And there's a lot that's happening when a child turns two or five or ten. Not all weeks are created equal. Like some weeks have the hospital in the story. And you didn't plan on the hospital having a role in this particular week. Like you didn't put it on the calendar. It wasn't on the schedule. But nevertheless, it's a part of things. The week where there's just a little fender bender, not a big car accident, just like a minor inconvenience. Well, like you're just on your way to Starbucks and you were running late and the morning was kind of wild and the person in front of you slammed on their brakes and you bumped them just a little bit and 
Now, kind of like your whole day has changed uh, a little bit. And again, it's not the end of the world. Nobody's hurt, um, but your world's impacted. Um, not all weeks are created equal. I don't know if you've ever had any water damage in your house before or anything happen in your home that changed the whole trajectory of your week. Uh, on my memories this week, something that popped up um, as a gift on social media for me was a couple of years ago when we had tree roots in our main water line. And so we dug up our whole front yard and we chopped down one of our trees. They don't do that for free, just so you know, just trying to make sure everybody's aware of that. That costs money. Uh, and we were displaced for several days, so thankfully had a good friend reach out to him, and he had a place where we could stay for a little bit. And that just totally changed the whole trajectory and tenor of our week. And it's just good for us to know that when we have weeks like that, when we have weeks that we maybe didn't plan, when we have weeks that have greater weight than other weeks, we have a Jesus who understands that. Because Jesus understands that some weeks carry greater significance than other weeks. And so we are celebrating, beginning today, Holy Week. So on Sunday, Jesus will enter Jerusalem, as Bruce read for us, on a donkey. And on Friday, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he will be crucified. So he will ride in on Sunday, and some like 120 hours later, don't check my math, it's an approximation, Jesus breathes his last. And the opportunity in front of us, just like any family has a calendar with certain dates circled and a star in the corner for grandma's birthday, and the church has a calendar. And this week we are celebrating we're remembering, we're entering into Holy Week. Um, if you're new to the Bible, there's really four biographies of Jesus. And so we have the Matthew biography, the Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's known as synoptic Biography. So what they're trying to do is they're, they're presenting a story, like the credits roll on the screen and everybody who was involved in the project, and then the project begins and what unfolds on the screen is this story. That's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are doing. They're trying to present the life of Jesus for the listener, that we would not just notice the life of Jesus, but that we would take up the life of Jesus. And then John, everybody's got that person in the family who just does things a little bit differently. Uh, that's John. John begins the gospel not with a story, but with a bunch of heady knowledge. And so we get to see as we unfold in the book of John uh, what it means to be God, what it means to be Savior. And so there's all these miracles and images. You have that person in your family that talks in metaphors. And sometimes you understand what they're saying, and sometimes you're like, would you just tell me in plain English what it is you're talking about? That's kind of the book of John. Uh, but the gospel account that Bruce read for us is Mark. And let me tell you about the book of Mark. The first 10 chapters of Mark are frantic. Like, it's like, I don't know, a roller coaster. The, the word that pops up most often in the book of John is this word immediately. And so Mark says, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then guess what? This happens. Mark is like a kid after a really busy day at school at supper when mom and dad say, hey, how was school today? And it's like, <laughs> that's the book of Mark. Immediately, 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 immediately. Let me tell you, the word immediately shows up in the New Testament 51 times. 41 of them are in Mark. Again and again and again. The first 10 chapters of Mark are frantic, are really fast-paced. 
And in the last six chapters of the book of Mark, it slows way down. It's kind of like when you are driving on the interstate at, of course, 65 miles an hour, because no one would ever dream about pushing it at all, and you get off the interstate and you go through like a sleepy town, right? You get off 29 and you got to go through Viberg, right? And what that experience feels like to go from pushing it to thinking you could walk faster. Like 25 miles an hour feels like a snail crawl when you're getting off the interstate. That's the experience of reading the book of Mark because the first 10 chapters of his gospel outline three years of the life of Jesus, three years of ministry, three years of teaching, three years of healing, three years of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Like, hey, guess what? There is a king, and it's not Rome. There's a king, and his name is Jesus. And he has a kingdom, and guess what? You're being invited to be a part of the kingdom. You're not being kept out of the kingdom. But you're invited in. But then the last six chapters cover eight days. So if you read the book of Mark and you feel some whiplash, it's good reason. Because it's frantic at the beginning and then it slows way down. And I think that's purposeful. It's not by accident. The pace slows in Jesus last week. And we're being invited, I think, to slow down with it. To not keep racing through the Jesus story, but to notice the small details of the Jesus story from stepping in to the city of Jerusalem to dying on a cross outside of the city of Jerusalem. There's things that were to notice. Can I tell you that this story is not here to be observed? This story is here to be absorbed. This is not a story you're just supposed to see, you're just supposed to notice, you're just supposed to know some things about in your head. But it's here that you would absorb all of the moments of this story. So Mark chapter 11, um, if you have been in and around church, you may know this story as the triumphal entry. If you're reading in your Bible, it might even say that. And one question is like, okay, well, what's happening? Uh, what is this triumphal entry all about? So Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. And there's this ridge that Jesus would have traveled down. I've got a little bit of a video that just kind of shows, this is shot from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem so you can see what it actually looks like. Remember, church, this is not a fairy tale. Like the good news of the gospel is in the dirt of our earth. Like this is an actual place. And this is the city of Jerusalem, just kind of like a flyover. And so as Jesus has his eye on Jerusalem, he tells his disciples, hey, I need some help. I need y'all to do something for me. Go into the city and get me something to ride into the city. And if someone tries to stop you because you're commandeering somebody else's donkey, just tell them, don't worry, the master needs it, the Lord needs it, it's all good. And that actually happens, right? So a couple disciples, they scurry from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem, and they find this donkey. They find this colt, right? And so Jesus rides this in to the city, and then there's this red carpet kind of moment. And let me tell you about the first century. When someone important was coming to town, I know it's not Santa, when someone important is coming to town, the process would be like you would get ready for this person. 
and you would run out to greet them and to bring them in. So do you remember when Jesus' friend Lazarus dies? And do you remember what happens? Jesus is in Bethany, right? He's outside and he comes into the city where Lazarus was buried. And do you remember that one of the sisters of Jesus runs out to greet him? Part of the reason that this sister is running out to greet him, to bring him in, this was a picture of the honor that Jesus had in this woman's life. It wasn't, it wasn't because she wanted to scold Jesus for not coming at the time that she thought that he should arrive, but it's a gesture of honor. So when there's an important Caesar coming to Jerusalem, everybody goes out to welcome him into the city. Like, it's a big deal. This is part of their practice. And what happens is the people who are traveling with Jesus, like at this time, there's people who have grabbed hold of the Jesus message, the Jesus story. And they're traveling with Jesus. They wanted to see what is he teaching and how is he interacting with people? What's the message that he has, the healing? Like this, he became famous. People were walking with him, traveling with him, literally. And these are the people that if you look at verse 9 of Mark chapter 11, says, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Let me show you something really cool that's being said in these verses. First thing that's really cool. Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. This is both future and past right? Because it's, it's being said of the kingdom that it's coming, that it's in the future, but what it's also being said of it is that it's the kingdom of David. Like, by this time, David has been dead a long time. People still knew about King David, like, stories were being told of him, like, all the incredible things that he did, like, he's a significant, powerful leader in the kingdom of Israel. Like, every kid knew about King David, Like every elderly grandma in Israel knew about King David. And so what's being said, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he. It is the future and the past. So when we talk about God's kingdom being eternal, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that it is here and now and we get glimpses of it. But there is more that is to come. We've talked about it around this community, kind of like when you go to the movies and there's previews coming in 2025, right? This movie, that's how we understand the kingdom. It's here, we get glimpses, but the feature film is still to come. But let me tell you, the biggest thing that happens is what doesn't happen. The the biggest thing, it's not the donkey. That is not the biggest thing in the story. The the biggest thing is not that the disciples obey Jesus and they go into Jerusalem and they steal a colt in Jesus' name. The, The biggest thing that happens is what doesn't happen because if you notice the way Mark tells it, what he doesn't say, is that all the people in the city who were celebrating Passover, all of the religious leaders, like the chief priest, and all of the people who worked in the temple every day that set up all the sacrifices and made sure all the candles were lit and that they stopped what they were doing as soon as they heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming into the city and they ran out to welcome him into the city and they put down their cloak and they grabbed a palm branch and they shouted, Hosanna in the highest. That's the thing that doesn't happen. Because if you look at the text, 
what the text says. Those who went ahead and those who followed. So those who are already traveling with Jesus, some of them went ahead. Like, ahead of who? Ahead of the donkey, ahead of Jesus, ahead of the group. And then other people followed. What Mark doesn't say is that all the people of Jerusalem who are celebrating Passover ran out and they welcomed him in. And can I tell you, like, I've read this story a lot. And as I was studying and reading this week, this like hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh man. The way that I've thought about this for a long time is that the crowd who is shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, and the, sh- and the, and the crowd that is shouting crucify, crucifies the same crowd. But Mark says, no, the biggest thing that happens is what doesn't happen the people of Jerusalem don't come out to welcome him in. The people who welcome him into the city are those who are walking with him. The biggest thing that happens is what doesn't happen. Jesus is largely ignored and he's unwelcomed by the leadership in Jerusalem. Like they got stuff to do. They're celebrating Passover. They're getting Passover ready. Like, they don't have time to celebrate this Jesus of Nazareth coming into the city. And Mark confronts us with something. That to ignore Jesus is to reject Jesus. To to build a life of ignoring The word of God through the person of God is to reject God. And so there's a question that comes. You know, when you go to a wedding and you walk past this sign, you're like, oh, but don't I feel welcomed? There's this question that Mark confronts us with. And this question, what does it mean to welcome Jesus? Like, like what does it mean to, to be a person who's traveling with Jesus, who puts down the cloak and welcomes him into the city? What's it look like? Uh, to do that, i got to introduce you to Grandma Lois. Uh, when Grandma Lois has her granddaughter Lydia come to visit, Lois wants Lydia to know that not only is Lydia welcome in her home, she's welcome in her life. And she's not leaving Lydia to hang out on the front step and knock at the front door like, Grandma, 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 let me in. And you've been around grandmas enough to know that as soon as they see the car outside, the door is open, and yes, the cookies are ready This triumphal entry presents us with this challenge. What does it look like to welcome Jesus? Like, what does it look like to welcome Jesus in our grief and in our sadness? To say, Jesus, like, I'm not hiding my grief from you. I'm not hiding my sadness from you. Like, I'm welcoming you into my sadness. Like, not into the highlight reel of my life. I'm not welcoming you into the answers that I have about faith. Like, look, Jesus, like, look at all the answers that I have about your kingdom and about faith. Like, do you see all my answers? No, it's welcoming Jesus into my grief and into my sadness. Like, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, Jesus, I'm, I'm welcoming you into my fear. Like the stuff that keeps me up at three o'clock in the morning. 
I'm welcoming you into my worry. God, I'm welcoming you into my dreams. Like the thing that I desperately want, but I don't really believe that it could happen. I'm welcoming you into that. Not just welcoming you into the highlight reel of my life. Jesus, you're welcome here. The biggest thing Mark says that happened is the thing that doesn't happen. And the tragedy of Holy Week, I'll invite the band up as we close. A lot of times we might think the tragedy of Holy Week happens on Friday. Like Sunday is happy and it's jubilant and it's exciting. Passover is happening and here comes Jesus on a donkey and palm branches and all that. But church, if we ask Mark, we're not waiting for Friday for there to be tragedy. If we ask Mark, tragedy starts on Sunday. And what's the tragedy? Great question. Mark 11, verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He doesn't stick around. He walked into the city. He looked around at the city. And he walked out. And if you're wondering, like, why does he do that? He's not welcomed and celebrated in that city. And this is a significant challenge for us as followers of Jesus, I think. To be welcomers of the Spirit of God in your life as a person to be welcomers of the the way of Jesus in this community. Like, Spirit of God, like, you're welcome here. Like, spend some time here. Uh, Like, notice that this is a place where we desire to take seriously the words of Jesus, the challenges of Jesus, the way of Jesus. We don't just want to give lip service to Jesus but we want to put flesh to our word because we follow a Jesus who put flesh to his word. So I just think there's a great tragedy in what happens on Palm Sunday. So we're not waiting for Friday for there to be tragedy. It's tragedy that he walks in, he looks around, and he walks out. And so as we step into this week, as we contemplate the suffering of Jesus we also get to reflect about the experience of Jesus being a person who welcomes him and so if you ask me do we have some things to learn about Grandma Lois I would say yes we do because we're not just sharing our home but our life that's something we could learn from her to not just say, God, I'm, I'm inviting you at 4.30 in the afternoon on Sunday here. But it's much bigger than that. 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon is just a picture of the way that I'm inviting you when we're not in this place. So 4.30 is just a celebration of how you are welcome. It's not the time that you are welcome. Uh, Can I tell you that that's difficult to do? Can I tell you that it's easy to talk about and hard to live out? But can I tell you that if John Mark was seated here with us tonight, that's how he would encourage us. He would encourage us to be welcomers of this king in all facets of our life. Like the tough stuff, the dark stuff, the difficult, 
the stuff that maybe some of us work to hide. Stuff that we don't even like and we know for sure God won't like it because we don't even like it. But the truth is that he's king of all or he's not king at all, isn't it? And the proclamation in this place is that he's king of all. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, for this time that we get to spend together contemplating these things, thinking about these things. God, we pray that you would help us, that you would empower us to be people not who hide from you, not who run from you, but people who seek you. Uh, people who seek your face, people who seek your way, uh, people who seek to live out what we are. As we come to the end of our gathering uh, tonight, we just ask that you would seek us and you would know us, that you would look deep within our hearts and all the places when we've turned from you and we've searched high and low for other kings and we ask, God, that you would make our hearts ready to receive the king of all who is in all and above all and through all, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing one more song together.